Welcome back to another Witcher lore video guys. So I was thinking about what video to make today and I realised that I haven't actually covered all the Northern Kingdoms yet, or at least the major ones. Because I'm sure as you guys all know, the major Northern Kingdoms include Temeria, Redania, Lyria and Rivia, Covia and Povis, Kedwin, Edirne, and finally what I'm going to make today's video on, Sintra. You could say that Skellig is a major northern kingdom, but it really isn't, it's just a collection of isles. It's actually considered a minor northern kingdom, and it's very separate to the main northern kingdoms. You've got to consider how big the other northern kingdoms are in comparison to Skelliger. So yeah, I thought for today's video, I'm going to cover the final major northern kingdom. And of course, that is Sintra. And before we get properly into today's video, I just want to say that there will be spoilers for the books in this episode, as Sintra is so heavily involved, at least early on. And I'd say later on as well, actually. So turn back now if you don't want any spoilers for the books. So anyway, to begin with, if you look at this map, you can see that the once great northern kingdom of Sintra is located north of Nazia and south of Temeria, just on the other side of the great river Yoruga. So that's what sets Sintra apart in a way. All the other northern kingdoms, at least the major ones, are all north of the river Yoruga, and Sintra is below that, where Nilfgaard is. So that obviously makes it a bit more of an easier target if Nilfgaard ever wanted to invade the north, which as I'm sure you'll know from The Witcher 3 and if you've read the books, they definitely do. So for this video, I've decided to go a little bit of a different route to my other Witcher places videos. So for example, with my other videos, I'll discuss bits about the kingdom, do little bullet points here and there, but I thought for Sintra it would probably be best just to discuss the major events in the books, as they are incredibly important to understand this country. And also of course I'll go over the whole lore of the kingdom that we know anyway. So to begin, at one point in history Sintra was actually one of the most powerful of the northern kingdoms, and it gained this power through its almost impenetrable mountainous defences against say Nilfgaard. Because you can see from this map that mountains pretty much cover the whole southern border of Sintra, and to the north they have the defence of the river Yuru so they're in a pretty strategic position. But its power was of course not only down to its defences, as at its peak it also had a battle-hardened ruler, the Lioness of Sintra, Queen Calanthe. And I'm sure those of you who will have read the books will know of Queen Calanthe, she was a very big part of The Last Wish and many other stories, which I will go into if I do a character video about her, but just for everybody else who's only played the games, she's Ciri's grandmother, and she's very similar to Ciri let's just say, but a bit more stern. So as I just mentioned then, it actually acts as a powerful buffer zone between the other northern kingdoms and the Nilfgaardian Empire, which obviously make it quite good pickings if Nilfgaard ever wanted to invade. Carrying on, Sintra remained a strong northern kingdom for a very long time, but sadly, Emir Var Emrys brought the full might of the Nilfgaardian Empire down on this kingdom, and after bravely fighting, the power of the Nilfgaardian Empire proved too much for them, and they were invaded. So the event after the invasion has many names, but the most commonly referred to name in the Northern Kingdoms is the Massacre of Sintra. And after this event, Queen Calanthe lay dead, and many thought she had killed her own granddaughter, Ciri, before the city of Sintra was razed to the ground. Because just to clarify, Sintra is the name of the kingdom, but the capital is also called Sintra. Similar to how they have the Nilfgaardian Empire, but the capital is Nilfgaard. And the kingdom itself of Sintra did not fare much better than the city of Sintra itself and it was left in ruins. In fact, after this invasion, there were a lot of Sintran refugees going over the river Yoruga to seek shelter in the other northern kingdoms. So of course, after all that, Sintra was now under the control of the Nilfgaardian Empire. And this event also started the first Nilfgaard Nordling War, and I'll discuss this war in more detail in future videos, but for now you just gotta know that Sintra was the country that after it was invaded, this entire war started and the wars to come afterwards. So the next part of this kingdom's history, I'm gonna have to explain some important plot points from the books. Because invading this kingdom was not just for land, it actually had a lot of other reasons behind it, and some of them I would say are emotional. So. As I'm sure you'll know, Emir is Ciri's dad, and obviously he was the Emperor of Nilfgaard at the time of the invasion. And it is actually thought that one of the main reasons for this war was for him to retrieve Ciri and also get rid of Calanthe, because she never really liked him when he was with Parvetta, her daughter. She didn't really approve of him. And obviously he would want his daughter as the Emperor of Nilfgaard, as he would want her to be able to carry on his line. But of course there's the obvious other reasons as to why Emir invaded this kingdom, and it's because he simply wanted to add Sintra to the ever-growing Nilfgaardian Empire, and then he also wanted a place in which he could then invade the other northern kingdoms, and then take control of the entire continent. So for this next part of the story, I'm just going to summarise it a little bit, as I'm not going to discuss everything that happened to Ciri in this time, or Geralt, or any of those other characters, I'm just going to say the main points to get the point across. 
So after Emir invaded Sintra, Ciri escaped, and was eventually found by Geralt, who then took her to Kaer Morhen, and she was hidden for quite a while, and then she was taught the ways of a witcher. So throughout this time that she was hidden, Emir continued to look for her, sending Nilfgaardian agents and other mercenaries to find her in the Northern Kingdoms. And eventually one of these bounty hunters discovered the location of a girl who looked very similar to Ciri, and who was also said to be a noble from Sintra. But at this point this girl was a refugee, and I think she was cutting cloth or something along those lines. So they decided that they would bring this fake Ciri to Nilfgaard and to Emir. So after bringing the fake Ciri back to Nilfgaard, Emir proclaimed her queen and also named her the Princess of Brugge, the Duchess of Sodden, the heir of Skellige, the Sovereign of Atra, and Abyara. So Emir did obviously later realise that this Ciri was not the real Ciri as he knew his own daughter, but after he spoke with his true daughter he decided to let her go her own way and he married the false Ciri as he had actually fallen for her at this point and this secured Sintra's loyalty as part of his empire. And this is something I want you all to brood over briefly because originally when Sintra was initially invaded, Emir sent Kay here to go and get Ciri and then bring her back to Nilfgaard as even though he knew that she was his daughter, he did plan to marry her still. I believe it was simply because he wanted to keep Sintra as part of the Empire and keep them in check. But honestly, you can't sign off the other reasons as well. So anyway, to move on to the next part of this video. And this last part is actually quite relevant as you may be wondering why the Sintrans would just simply accept Emir as their ruler. I mean, he may have married fake Ciri who they thought was their rightful queen, but he did also ruin a lot of their lives and ruin their way of life by burning their city to the ground, by invading the kingdom and just creating all this horrible war. But what I will say, the reason he was accepted so easily was because of the way in which succession works in Sintra. So succession in Sintra is very different compared to every other northern kingdom. So to explain it quickly, even if their current ruler was a queen, if she were to marry someone, her husband would automatically become the king of Sintra, and in the people's and the court's eyes, the de facto ruler of the kingdom. So that's even if who she marries has no links to Sintra whatsoever, he just becomes king. And this rule also works if there was say a queen of Sintra with a princess for a daughter and no sons, if the princess were to marry her husband, that would actually dethrone the current queen, and the guy married to the princess would become king himself, and then the princess would become queen. So you can see that the line of succession is very biased towards men in Sintra, and that's why Emir would have been accepted so easily. And in fact, one of the most memorable stories from The Last Wish was when Geralt was hired by the famous ruler of Sintra, Calanthe the Lioness of Sintra. And just to quickly interject, I'm not going to get into the full story of this, but in this story, Calanthe manages to find a way for her daughter and herself to get married while she still remains the ruler of Sintra. And she did this quite cleverly by marrying the Skelligan Ice Twiersect. And you may be thinking, oh, surely Ice must become King of Sintra then. And you would actually be correct in thinking that, but Ice himself had no interest in ruling Sintra whatsoever and would much rather just raid and then being Skellige, and he also loved Calanthe. Therefore, he just left the ruling of this kingdom to his wife and allowed her to make all the important decisions. And therefore, she could then rule Sintra, and even if her daughter was married, she had a husband who was king, so he would only be dethroned once he died. Or abdicated. So anyway, now to move on to this kingdom's coat of arms. So the coat of arms consists of three golden lions on an azure field. So from the reign of the Sintran ruler Coram II, the three lions became crowned. And it's not known why there is a lion on the flag of Sintra, but we can imagine it must be to do with it being an intimidating and fearsome beast. And of course this country's emblem is a lion and its symbol is a lion, so that's actually how Calanthe and Ciri earn their nicknames, the Lioness of Sintra, which is Calanthe's nickname, and the Lion Cub of Sintra, which is Ciri's nickname. So the rulers of Sintra is the House of Raven, which is the dynasty which Ciri belongs to, but of course the actual power pulling all the strings behind Sintra is Nilfgaard. And the official language of Sintra is common speech, and its currency is known as the Sintrian Golden Ducat. And we only know three countries that use the Ducat as their currency, and that is Sintra, Kedwin, and the Skellige Isles. And of course, like every other Northern Kingdom, its government is a hereditary monarchy. So now to move on to the notable landmarks of Sintra. So for cities and keeps, there's the city of Sintra, the city of Atra, Ortegor, and Tig. And for regions, there is Upper Sodden, Erlenwald, and Strept. Next for the notable people of Sintra. So to begin with, there are the monarchs, Kerbin, Corel, Coram the First, Coram the Second, Corbett, Dagorad, and Calanthe. Well, actually, technically it would be Iced, but she was pretty much the ruler. And as for the other royalty, there's Syrah, Parvetta, and Cirilla. So for the aristocracy, there's Windhelm, Rainfarn, Eilenbert, Musak, Visigurd, and Haxo. And for the others, there is Angulami. And finally, to end today's video, I'm going to read a little quote about Sintra from Blood of Elves. 
This is Sintra, is that right? Yes, south of the river Transiver and Sodden, this way, here, flows the river Yaruga, flowing into the sea right at Sintra. And of course I forgot to mention completely, the city of Sintra itself and the city of Atra are directly next to the sea. And the mountains I mentioned that are actually in Sintra and act as a natural border are known as the Asmel Mountains. Anyway guys, I hope you've all enjoyed today's video, this was quite a fun one to make actually, I'm kind of happy that I finished all the major northern kingdoms, of course I still have the Skelliger Isles which are going to be fun to do, there's a lot of culture and history there, but you can actually see from all the maps and stuff that the Skelliger Isles are significantly smaller than the major kingdoms, but they're still really cool. But anyway guys, I hope you've all enjoyed today's video. As always guys, be sure to like today's video, it really does help me out, it's really really kind if you do that. Obviously these videos take a long time to do, so by liking the video it just shows me that you really do enjoy them, so thank you all for doing that. If this is the first video you're finding on my channel, I do Witcher lore videos every few days, I also do Witcher parts, I do some Oblivion, I do some other lore from different series you probably will enjoy if you like The Witcher, so be sure to subscribe if you want to get more of those sort of videos. And of course, be sure to follow me on Twitter, I do updates on there whenever I can, I post whenever I make a video and it comes up on Twitter, and that's useful because sometimes YouTube doesn't send them to your subscription boxes, or sometimes you might just end up missing the video accidentally, I do that all the time. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll have an extra chance to see that video if you just happen to miss it in your subscriptions. Also of course, be sure to follow me on Twitch, I plan to get a better computer soon, I'm gonna save up for a bit, and the main reason I haven't been doing Twitch is because I have so many issues when streaming, I think my processor probably isn't powerful enough, I wanna try and sort out my internet a bit, try and get that a bit more stable, because then I'll be able to do some streaming. The main reason is, is it takes a lot of effort to even get it to work, and even after that I run into issues while streaming. So be sure to follow me on there if you want to get the notification for when I do go live, because it probably will be actually quite soon. And as always, a big thank you to the Patreon pledges, you guys are just amazing, it's very very kind that you all donate to me, I just want to say a big thank you to all of you, it's really really kind what you do. I recently changed the whole text of the patrons, I believe this may even be the first video that I've changed the text, so I hope you guys all like it, but it's actually allowed me to fit way more names in on each page, so yeah, I hope all you patrons out there appreciate that, because I really appreciate what you guys do. But anyway guys, I hope you've all enjoyed today's video, and I'll see you in the next one. Have an awesome rest of the week.